بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ما بعد. Today we will be talking about Tipu Sultan, uh, a man who governed parts of India, uh, to be precise, southern India, and he was one of the most powerful Muslim kings who ever governed parts of India. Why is he important? There were many Muslim kings in the Indian subcontinent who governed uh, different territories. Why is Tipu Sultan more important than others? Why are we talking about him? Tipu Sultan is more important because of his profile. His profile is very, very special. He was a very special character in many respects. Uh, and I will summarize some of his characteristics. One of his top characteristics was that he was a very deeply dedicated Muslim. He is important for Muslims of India because he was a good Muslim. He was trying his best to be a good Muslim uh, within his capacity. Being a king in India and being a good Muslim at the same time was not an easy task uh, because India is a very diverse society. It has been diverse for thousands of years and Muslims came quite late, uh, almost a thousand years ago or slightly more than a thousand years ago when Muslims appeared as a political entity within the Indian subcontinent. And then we have Tipu Sultan who governed parts of India or southern India, parts of southern India in the 18th century. He came to power as the Sultan, as the king in 1782. 1782 when his father Sultan Haider Ali uh, died. So Sultan Haider Ali was a soldier of fortune. He was simply a soldier initially. He uh, was uh, raised in the ranks of the army and from a soldier he became a general. From a general he himself became the Sultan. And his son Sultan Fatih Ali Muhammad Tipu succeeded him in 1782. Tipu Sultan was born in 1750. He was born in 1750 and he died in 1799 at the age of 49. And he was killed in battle on the 4th of May 1799 during the 4th anglo mysore War. So there are anglo mysore Wars between that, that took place between the East India Company, the British at the time, or those who represented Britain, Brit British colonialism in India at the time, and uh, Tipu Sultan or the state of Mysore made by Hyder Ali and his son Tipu Sultan. So there were four wars, not battles, wars that took place between these two entities. The British East India Company that had ambitions to occupy all of India, and on the other hand, we had the state of Mysore governed by initially Hyder Ali and his son Tipu Sultan. So this is a short introduction. Tipu Sultan is special because of his dedication to Islam. He was a very deeply religious man. His letters, his documents, his correspondence with other kings and his uh, actions, his coinage, his policies, everything demonstrates Islam. He upheld Islam as his way of life. He was deeply inspired by the Islamic civilization. And he was a man who had brought together religi religiosity with high rega regard for technology and science. I will repeat that. Tipu Sultan was special in particular when it comes to the Indian subcontinent Muslim context. He was particularly special because he brought religiosity and high regard for science and technology in one person. That's Tipu Sultan, to put it in very, very sim simple terms. There were many Muslim kings in India. Many of them were highly religious, but they were not innovative when it comes to technology and science. They were not very advanced in education, in knowledge, or uh, when it comes to doing things to make 
the, the lives of their people better. Many of these Muslim kings who governed India, many of them, not all of them, many of them were simply kings. They just came, they governed, they had their fun, they had their parties and they died. Like all other Hindu kings and the British rulers. Very few were genuinely concerned about the well-being of their people. Tipu Sultan was definitely one of them. His profile, his history demonstrates beyond any doubt that he was one of those who was highly concerned about the well-being of his people. And when I say his people, that means Muslims, Hindus, Christians. These are the people he governed. And he was a diplomat par excellence. He was a scholar who had a library of 2,000 books. The catalogue of his library was published by a British scholar in 1811, which is titled uh, The Catalogue of Tipu Sultan's Library. And he had close to 2,000 books in his personal library. He used to study. He would study at times French philosophers, people like Voltaire, people like Rousseau, Montesquieu. He would like to know what's happening in Europe. He inquired at times about the French Revolution because he had French soldiers, generals working for him. He had factories producing weapons in Sarangapatam, in his capital. He would pray five times a day. He would read the Quran very diligently. He would want to die a martyr, which is what happened with him. He had the choice to leave the battlefield, to save his life, to live today and fight tomorrow. Some of his soldiers came to him that, Sultan, today your life is in danger. Escape with your entourage. He refused and he fought and he was killed in battle. And for that reason, the British paid him a very lavish tribute on his uh, funeral the day he was buried. So I'll be talking about these things in detail in due course. I have a very long presentation with me and I don't think I, I can possibly cover all of it today, but I will share some glimpses from the life of this great man, Tipu Sultan. As I mentioned that he was a politician par excellence, a military man par excellence, he was a general of high repute, high credibility. He had the obedience and the loyalty of his forces. Even the British respected him to, to an extent that within his lifetime, tons of works were published in Europe by the French, by the Germans and by the British in their respective languages. So in Britain, tons of works. In the 1780s, 1790s, and even after the martyrdom of Tipu Sultan were published. And some of them I possess in my personal library. Then French published works to pay tributes to him. So did the Germans. And often he was painted as a tyrant, as a Muslim bigot, as a tyrant. What's changed? I mean, nowadays, when you look at Muslim profile on Western media, what do you see? Muslims extremists, terrorists, violent people, backward, regressive, not very progressive. This is what you see on Western media. ISIS, they equate Islam with ISIS. The Western media quite subtly, in some cases quite openly, equates Islam with entities like ISIS, unfortunately. This is happening today. It's not new. Muslims have seen this before. Same thing happened with Tipu Sultan. Tipu Sultan was painted as a barbarian in Europe. He is an animal that needs controlling as soon as possible. In the British Parliament, there were debates in the 18th century, in the 1700s, in the late 1700s, where British politicians would paint a very vicious picture of the Sultan. There were plays in Britain where the Sultan was portrayed as a bloodthirsty, uh, a promiscuous individual who has a harem of thousands of women, all he needs is this. This is how he was painted. This is how people are painted today. And nothing has ch changed, unfortunately, when it comes to demonizing uh, the opponent. It was after his death 
and I would say two centuries after his death, when he was truly appreciated by Western scholarship. There have been some recent works recently. One of them is by Kate Brittlebank, who is an Australian, uh, Australian scholar on Tipu Sultan. She has written a book on Tipu Sultan. She published it in the 90s, um, and she tried to put the record straight. And recently she published another book titled uh, The Tiger of Mysur, Tipu Sultan, to put the record straight. Because recently in India, due to the new government, or old government now, BJP, uh, you know, they had this fascination with demonizing Tipu Sultan and Aurangzeb Alamgir in particular, these two individuals. Why? Because they were highly Islamic in the characters. Both had high regard for Islam. So Tipu Sultan is special, despite all the propaganda and all the negativity around him, he is special for a number of reasons. He was a very advanced, technologically advanced, progressive, scholarly, intelligent, intellectual king. He invested in agriculture, he invested in cotton production, he invested in clothing, he invested in diplomacy, he invested in military advancement, military technology. Tipu Sultan is known to have used rockets as a weapon of war for the first time in human history. Did you know that? Rockets that are used today to threaten each other, countries threaten each other by producing rockets, yeah? From here you get Rhori and Hataf and Udaseh from the other side. Do you know the missiles from the other side? Agni? Prithvi. And amazingly, if you look at the names of the missiles, they have some historical uh, background. Prithvi is named after Prithvi Raj Chauhan, who was a Raja defeated by Shahabuddin Ghori. So in response to Prithvi, we have Ghori. We have Ghaznavi. We have Al Khalid Tank. So this is what's happening. But Tipu Sultan was a son of the Indian subcontinent. He wanted to revive the dominance of Islam in the Indian subcontinent. He wanted to bring back the Muslim civilization to prominence, which is not a bad thing. Muslim civilization gave a lot to India in terms of identity, in terms of history, in terms of literature, education, poetry, you name it. Muslim civilization contributed highly, positively to the Indian subcontinent. Despite what the Bajrang Dal, Shiv Sena and RSS propaganda is. They are trying to change history against all the odds of serious historians. So he was one of the first people to have used rockets as a weapon of war. And a statue of his rockets was found nearly in southern India. One of my friends, I don't know if he's listening, uh, his name is Nidin. George Olikara, and he's from India. Uh, he was one of the people responsible for the stash of um, rockets found in a well, and they have been placed in a museum recently uh, um, in southern India, in the city of Shimoga. So these rockets were deadly. The British were terrified of Tipu Sultan's military tactics. They were terrified of this man, despite all the coalitions they had with them. Now, Tipu Sultan was not fighting one army. He was fighting a number of enemies. He was fighting the Nizam of Hyderabad, who was an ally of the British. He was fighting the Marathas, who were die-hard enemies of the Muslim dominance of India. He was fighting the British, who wanted to completely wipe out Muslim power from India, so that they can become dominant politically. Only people standing in the way of British ambitions or the East India Company ambitions in India were Muslim rulers like Tipu Sultan. And he was an exception. He had to go. At any cost, he had to go. And what made Tipu Sultan what he was? His faith, his religion, his attachment to Islam. If you look at his coinage, what you can see on the screen there is an image of a double rupee of Tipu Sultan. It was almost 22 grams or between 20 to 20, 
22 to 23 grams of silver. This coin is very valuable now. You can find it for 3,000 pounds <laughs> if you want to buy it, right? It's very rare. For some reason, it's become very rare. And it has the name of the Sultan. It says, Huwa Sultan al-Wahid al-Adil. He is the only just Sultan in India. Okay, the name of uh, the mint is there. This particular coin was minted in, if I'm not mistaken, in his capital, Surangapatam. And the date is there. So this is an image of his coin. You know what this coin was called? Hydri. There were other coins which we will see in due course that were named after the Prophet, after the second Caliph of Islam, Abu Bakr Siddiq, and Al Farooq, the sorry, the, the second Caliph of Islam, Al Farooq, and the first Caliph of Islam, Abu Bakr Siddiq. So coins were named after these people. What's your currency called today? Rupees. Rupees and pesas, right? Pesa or rupia, right? Tipu Sultan's currency was called Ahmadi, Siddiqui, Faruqi, Hydri, Uthmani. These were the names of his currency, as we will see, inshallah, in due course. So even in his coinage, economically, his policy uh, required that religion is dominant. It, it is seen, his attachment to religion is seen is in, in, his course, in his letters, in his correspondence, in his uh, diplomacy. In fact, when he sent um, a delegation to the king of Afghanistan, Zaman Shah, at the time, he wrote specific instructions for the delegation. The delegation consisted of dignitaries from the state, ministers, negotiators, foreign secretary, for example, and an entourage of soldiers who would protect the presence, the gifts, as well as the dignitaries. So Sultan personally wrote instructions for them that every single one of you who is part of this delegation must pray five times a day. You shall not compromise your dedication to your salah. This is the Sultan, the king, giving instructions to his delegation. There hasn't been a king like this in Indian history, in the history of the subcontinent. A Muslim king like him. Never. Never before him, never after him. Today, amazingly, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, delivered a speech in uh, Chachro, Sindh. Did anyone watch that speech? A part of it. Just yeah. Part of it. Okay. In that speech, he made a very uh, powerful statement. He said, Our hero is Tipu Sultan. He mentioned this man. Even today, in the 21st century, in 2019, Tipu Sultan is held in high regard by the Muslims of the subcontinent. Why not the Nawab of Awadh? Why not one of the Mughal emperors like Shah Alam, Muhammad Shah, Farooq Siyar, or uh, Jahangir, Shah Jahan? Why not one of them? In fact, Imran Khan made a statement that our hero is not Bahadur Shah Zafar. Someone is... Uh, weak and uh, and lame as him. No. Our hero is Tipu Sultan. And if threatened, if threatened, we, the people of Pakistan and the military, will fight to death against anyone who will try to subdue us. We will not allow anyone to bully us. This is what Imran Khan said today in his speech. And who did he make his example? Who? Tipu Sultan. Why? Why? The example is very, very clear. Tipu died fighting on battlefield despite being a king. Rahmatullahi alayhi. So this is why Imran Khan gave him as an example. Tipu Sultan was a master diplomat. He sent delegations to the king of France and then after the king of France was deposed by the French Revolution, who came to power? Napoleon Bonaparte. Tipu Sultan started to communicate with him. Tipu Sultan was communicating with the Turkish Sultan, the Ottoman Sultan in Turkey. 
Tipu Sultan was communicating with the king of Iran. He was communicating with the king of Afghanistan. He was also communicating with local kings and rajas. He was trying to get the Marathas on his side. He was sending letters to, letters to Marathas to join his ranks against the increasing, increasingly threatening British East India Company ambitions. And you know what he would write in his letters that these Kotidars, these were the words he would use, these Kotidars. Kotidars means what? Kotidars means these people who have come for businesses. They are businessmen. They are not concerned about the well-being of the people of India. They are simply businessmen. They are here for business. The East India Company were business people. And they had devastated Bengal, Orissa and Bihar after they had taken it following the Battle of Plassey in 1757. So Tipu Sultan was talking with substance. Then look at the condition of the provinces they are governing. Once they take all of India, everyone will suffer. You will be slaves. And this is exactly what happened. And the British never claimed India completely as theirs until this man was killed. Until this man was no more. And until this man was no more, the British never claimed racial, religious, cultural superiority over the Indians, let alone the Muslims. The British, their sense of superiority, whether it was racial, religious, cultural, political, military, whatever it was, it came after the killing of Tipu Sultan in battle. Until he was alive, the British could never claim superiority. You know why? Because his weapons, his technology, his advancement, his knowledge, his intelligence far, was far superior than what the British claimed for themselves, the East India Company. So there's a reason why Tipu Sultan became a villain for the British establishment in India at the time. He was painted as a barbarian, he was painted as a tyrant, as an oppressor, but the reality was completely opposite. Mysore, the state he governed, was one of the most prosperous states in India. In fact, some of the surveys, some of the surveys conducted by the British having taken his territory, one of the surveys was published in 1807, almost seven to eight years after Tipu Sultan's martyrdom. One of the surveys was conducted by a man called Francis Buchanan. Francis Buchanan published his survey in three volumes in 1807. And in this survey, he states that the state of Tipu Sultan, what he governed, Mysore, it is very prosperous. The agriculture is good, the cattle is good, the business is good, the people are happy. <coughs> and what happened after he had died, things went back to the way they were before Tipu Sultan and his father took power in Mysore. Mysore was a very small state consisting of 33 little towns. Hyder Ali made it a power in India and Tipu Sultan made it, made it even more important due to his diplomacy. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that Tipu Sultan was actually communicating with Thomas Jefferson? Thomas Jefferson was the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence for the Americans. And at the time, the Americans were struggling, uh, struggling against British imperialism in the Americas. The American War of Independence was directly supported and funded by Sultan Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan. Not many people know this. There is written, document, documented evidence available on that point. There is a letter in the hand of Thomas Jefferson which states, the embassy of Tipu Sahib has arrived from India. If you go and Google Thomas Jefferson and Tipu Sultan and go to images, you will see the image of this letter, a scan of this letter. I might have it in my presentation. The embassy of Tipu Sahib has arrived in America. We're talking about the 18th century. 
1700s. There was a battle in 1780s, a naval battle between America, American forces and British naval forces. This battle was called the Battle of Delaware. If I'm not mistaken, it happened in 1787. And one of the American vessels, are you listening everyone? Yes. One of the American vessels, an American warship. Which ship? Warship. warship. Belonging to who? The Americans. And this was, as far as the Americans were, con were concerned, this was the war of independence against an imperial power called Britain. So the battle is between the British naval forces and American naval forces. One of the vessels, one of the four vessels, because there were four vessels on both sides, four warships on both sides, the British side and the Americans, eight in total. One of the American vessels was called Hyder Ali. The Americans called one of the warships, Hyder Ali, to taunt the British. That the way you are being treated in India, you will get the same treatment here. And no doubt, Hyder Ali was a big menace for the British East India Company in India. Tipu Sultan became uh, even a bigger menace. And this is why it became absolutely uh, crucial for him to go. For him to either lose his power, lose his state or lose his life for that matter. And this is what happened, unfortunately. Um, I do not have the time to go into all the history of Tipu Sultan. But to cut the long story short, in 1792, uh, as a result of the Third Anglo-Mysore War, Tipu Sultan lost half his territory. And then he never let go of his ambitions to get rid of the British and the imperialism from India. He was a very strong character who had strong ambitions to liberate India from the oppressive, the tyrannical and selfish rule of the East India Company, a bunch of businessmen who were simply there to make business out of India and Indian people. Uh, Muslims primarily and at large Hindus as well as those who were not Muslims, other than Hindus. So Tipu Sultan represented all of them. Until not very long ago, Tipu Sultan was an Indian hero until BJP came to power. BJP wants to wipe out any trace of Muslim history from Indian uh, landscape. Some of them are so extreme. One of them he recently came on media and he said Taj Mahal was made by Hindus. <laughs> Taj Mahal was made. Taj Mahal actually is a Hindu building. It was made by Hindus. All, even though there are verses of the Quran on Taj Mahal here, <laughs> inscribed by Persian artisans, Shah Jahan had got them. So uh, a lot of this is taking place. A lot of extremism is taking place in India. And this is one of the reasons why Prime Minister Imran Khan today made another statement that the Hindus of Pakistan, we stand with them and we will never allow them to be oppressed. We will never, because they are a minority in Pakistan. They are our responsibility. We need to take care of them. We don't. We, 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 we can't afford... One of the ministers was recently sacked for making a statement against the Hindus, generally speaking. Not knowing that there are Hindus in Pakistan as well. You may be offending them, right? So, to the contrary, in India what's happening is the BJP government is specifically hunting Muslims. Today I saw images literally on my way to this venue. Today, on Facebook, I saw images of Hindus playing Holi. You know Holi? Yes. When they play with colors. They throw colors on each other. Muslim men are walking past with their hats and with this white kurtas and they are deliberately throwing colors on Muslim men and women to taunt them, to degrade them, to, de to humiliate them. Literally, wallahi, by Allah, I watched these videos uh, on my way to this venue on Facebook. Uh, there is a Facebook page you must look at, Documenting Oppression Against Muslims. Documenting Oppression Against Muslims. It's a Facebook page. They put up a lot of these videos for you to see what's happening in India with Muslims. And who are Muslims? Muslims gave their lives to liberate India. Starting with the Mughals and then 
people like Tipu Sultan and then later on even during the Indian Mutiny, 1857, during the War of Independence, Muslims paid a heavy price. And even during the partition, even in the First and the Second World War, Muslims fought for the British with the prospect of independence in the mind. Because the British, has pro they had promised that if you fight for us, we will liberate India. And that's why millions of Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus fought in the Second World War for the British. They fought the Nazis, Indians, Muslims, Sikhs. And <laughs> so you cannot separate Muslims from the history of India, no matter what you do. The contribution of Islam and Muslims in the Indian subcontinent is absolutely amazing. Muslims gave you poets like Mir, poets like Ghalib, you know, Persian poets like Amir Khusro, right? Muslims gave you the landscape you have today. Muslims gave you the culture, the language. So, Tipu Sultan stood as a giant and he still stands as a giant and he will stand until the day of judgment because of his character. His religious character, his attachment to Islam is even more uh, revealed, even more so in his dreams. After his martyrdom, I, I intended to use the PowerPoint presentation, but I don't think I'm going to do that now because I have, uh, from uh, my fascination for Tipu Sultan and from my memory, the information I have stored in my mind, I have decided to go with this lecture. But I will very briefly go through some of the things I want to show you on PowerPoint presentation later on, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, I think online audience will not be missing out on that either. So, what was the last point I was going to make before I mention this? Tipu Sultan, what was the last point I made? You were talking about his his dreams, his dreams. You see, you get to know a person by the dreams he or she has, right? वो कहते हैं ना उर्दू में कहावत है बिल्ली के ख्वाब में वो क्यों कहते हैं बिल्ली के ख्वाब में चिचड़े वो क्यों कहते हैं हाँ Why do they say that in Urdu? Uh, and I will translate that into English that a cat only sees चिचड़ों की English क्या होगी हाँ Jalebi ki English, I don't know. Chichre is, a, chichre is a very special Urdu word. And that means the, the extra fat on, on meat, basically. Extra fat on meat, which the, which the butchers take off and they chuck it in the bin. You know, it's rubbish. So th that stuff is fed to cats and dogs. So there's a, there's a, there's a saying in Urdu that cat always dreams of those, those extras, right? Because they're so tasty for cats, right? So likewise, people dream of things they desire. Do you all agree? Yes. Right. <laughs> Tipu Sultan had a diary of his dreams. He had a diary of his dreams, which was the most personal item of his life. Is everyone listening? Yes. This was the most personal item of his life. His diary of his dreams. And he never allowed anyone to touch it. His servants had seen him documenting it and reading it in his private chamber in his palace but he never allowed anyone to touch it on pain of death no one was allowed to touch it and it was found in his private drawer in his private chamber and who pointed it out one of his private servants called Raja Khan he pointed it out to the British that there is a document a diary which the Sultan keeps closer to himself than his life and no one is allowed to touch it they opened it and it was about over 30 dreams of Tipu Sultan documented in his own hand. In his own handwriting. And the manuscript, the actual handwritten manuscript, the original is with Briti the British Library in London. It is there. And a scholar called Salimuddin Qureshi has translated these dreams into Urdu. You can find the Urdu translation in Islamabad at Said Book Bank in Janasapur. Okay, it's published by Sangamil Press uh, and it is called in Urdu Khwab Namai Tipu Sultan. Khwab Namai Tipu Sultan. So you will know a man by 
his dreams. I will share two of his dreams with you very quickly and then I will end my conversation here or this presentation here because the time is up. Uh, I've already been speaking for some time. Um, in this Khwab Nama, I will mention two dreams in particular. One is Tipu Sultan writes in his own handwriting. And by the way, let me remind you again, this book or this particular diary was not written to show off to people. How do we know that? It was kept privately in his private chamber and no one was allowed to touch it, let alone look at it. Okay? So it was his private diary, which he was writing for himself for personal use, not showing off that I am so and so, special I am such a guy that I'm having these dreams. Right? So one of the dreams he states in his own handwriting that I saw this dream on such and such date that Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an came to me and he said, come with me. Come with me. And I asked him, where do you want me to come with you? He said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu is waiting for you at the gate of Jannah. At the gate of paradise. And he wants to go in Jannah with you. Allahu Akbar. He wants you to take, he wants to take you to paradise with him. And then he writes, Sanad wa bas. That, mean, that means, this is it. I have nothing more to say. And he stops there. And no one, no, keep in mind, no one was allowed to read this diary. This is his, per so this, this is how you know this is a true dream, which he actually had, and he documented it for his personal use, not for public. And Allah always exposes his awliya. Allah always exposes his friends. Allah does not, you see, this diary could have been lost. It could have been destroyed by the British. It could have been ripped apart. or anything. It has survived in his handwriting. It is in the British Library, in the collection. This is one of the dreams. And I believe this dream foretold his martyrdom. Okay, he will be shaheed and he will be with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another dream he had was, he was on a campaign against the Marathas. He was on a campaign against the Marathas. Marathas were a very oppressive, repressive, destructive Hindu power in central and southern India who were simply only interested in looting and polluting and destroying. They were not Indian patriots, patriots as the BJP and Bajrang Dal and RSS paint them. You know, Shivaji has become a hero for some reason, Shivaji was a man who fought Aurangzeb Alamgir and Aurangzeb Alamgir fought him. Uh, and he was just a, you know, a rebel who was causing destruction uh, in the countryside. If he loved India as the Hindu right or the Hindu extremists claim today, he wouldn't be destroying the countryside, would he? He wouldn't be burning crops and burning villages and killing people indiscriminately, would he? He wouldn't be doing that, right? This is what he was doing, Shivaji and his son, Sambaji, right? And the Marathas who came after were doing the same thing. They were known for their destruction. So Tipu Sultan was having a war with them. And they were, across, they were camped, the Marathas were camped across the river. And Tipu Sultan had camped on this side of the river, wherever he was. And at night he had a dream. And he documents this dream in this diary as well. That a man... Sorry, uh, a lady came. A lady came to me. A beautiful-looking lady came to me in my dream, and I started talking to her. And during the discussion, during the conversation, we became very kind of the discussion became very intimate. And then I realized that it doesn't befit me as a king uh, or as a Muslim to be so intimate with this person. And then what happened, this person stood up and it, this person, he or she started dancing, right? Dan this person started dancing. And then while this person was dancing, the hair became loose. The hair became loose. And I realized it was a man dressed as a woman. It was a man dressed as a woman. And then I woke up. Then I woke up. So there was an ishara. There was a sign for him in his dream. Where is he? Where was he when he had this dream? 
he was on a campaign against the marathas marathas are on the other, are on the other side of the river he's on this side with a very small army against the marathas who were who were very big in numbers so he had this dream he woke up at night right and as soon as he woke up he knew the tabir he knew the meaning of the dream he got his forces together 200 men how many 200 men and he said to them i had this dream and the dream means that these people on the other side of the river who look like men are actually women they are actually women they do not have the courage to fight you attack 200 men attacked thousands of marathas and they left their camps and they ran for their lives this was the tabir of the dream which tipu sultan documented and he documented the result as well that by the grace of allah we attacked their camp with 200 men and they ran for their lives because in the dream he was told attack don't fear because they are women in men's dressing so in the dream he was shown this so this is another dream a second dream which tipu sultan had documented in his own hand uh, and if you google dreams of tipu sultan google if you google it and you will see uh, an article published by the british library you will see the article there inshallah some of these things i will mention very quickly um, you will see them in the presentation as well there is so much i can talk about when it comes to tipu sultan his wars his policies his uh, his investment in agriculture in the technology in weapons i'll give you one example for example uh, when it, when it comes to his advancement in technology he was so advanced that he produced his own weapons in factories uh, situated in srangapatam his capital he was producing his own rifles his own handguns they were so good that once he ordered a contingent of uh, guns from france guns i mean when i say guns i mean cannons you know cannon that used to fire cannon balls at that time that was one of the best weapons to use in war the contingent came with the french engineers he looked at it and he said this is rubbish this is rubbish and they said what do you mean this is rubbish we are french engineers we are the best in the world like you know aajkal aapke f16s aur aapke jets sare jo hain wahi se aa rahe hain na when you fight wars who benefits tipu sultan had understood this this is why he invested in his own people he invested his own in in his own engineers he had got his own men trained as engineers this is why when you see some of his weapons produced in his factories the name of the engineer for example asadullah is there on the guns the name of the engineer is there and those were such good quality weapons even the french were shocked so when he told the french engineers that this is rubbish this is not good they said okay do you have something better than that he said come with me so tipu sultan took them to his factories and he showed them the quality of his weapons produced in srangapatam in india they were shocked they said we cannot produce this we cannot produce this and when you look at some of the pictures of his weapons you will see exactly what we're talking about this is why the british were so terrified of him the east india company one of the weapons he used in war was a genius weapon you know when they used to produce swords in factories at the time there used to be a lot of waste you know when you produce swords when you produce swords by hammering them by melting iron there is a lot of extras left shrapnels right sometimes blades what he used to do he used to tell his army don't waste this take these shrapnels and blades when you fire a cannon ball before you fire a cannon ball on top of the cannon ball put these shrapnels and blades so when the cannon ball fires what happens all of these thousands of shrapnels with blades and all kinds of things are landing on the british army so the soldiers who might not be hit by the ball they will definitely be hit by these tiny blades and shrapnels the british were terrified of these tactics he was using against them they were terrified so this is why he had to go so the british joined hands with the marathas and the uh, the nizam of hyderabad in 1799 they besieged his capital tipu sultan had the chance to run away and his soldiers said to him sultan escape with your life but he refused he said uh, on the day he was killed rahmatullah alayh he was having his lunch with his uh, generals and soldiers and he was told that the uh, the northern wall has been breached of the fortress 
so he had a morsel in his hand which he was going to put in his mouth jisko hum nawala kehte hain urdu mein so he looked at his generals and he said it seems our lives are very limited it seems our life i mean he knows this man knows what's coming he can escape he can run he can go he can save his life he looks at his generals he goes it seems our life is very short very little is left now he put it down he asked for his horse which was called taus he mounted his horse and he went towards the battlefield and in the battlefield one of his soldiers one of his private uh, servants he said to the sultan please sultan run away escape we will fight the battle today escape with your life and fight tomorrow and he looked at his servant and he said are you mad have you lost your mind do you think i will run away from the battlefield you know this saying which is attributed to tipu sultan what, what is it शेर की एक दिन की जिंदगी गीदड़ की सौ साल जिंदगी से बेहतर है बाय द वे दिस पर्टिकुलर सेइंग एट्रिब्यूटेड टू टिपू सुल्तान इज मे नॉट बी ऑथेंटिक मे नॉट बी ऑथेंटिक इवन दो इकबाल अलूडेड टू इट इन हिज पोएट्री फॉर एग्जांपल इकबाल इन हिज जावेद नामा इन पर्शियन ही स्टेटेड आई फॉरगॉट द एक्चुअल वर्स आई रिमेंबर्ड इट Alama Iqbal admired Tipu Sultan daily very very much in 1929 Alama Iqbal visited his tomb and sat inside his tomb and cried for hours and when he came out having cried for hours alone inside the inside the sanctuary one of his uh, companions asked Iqbal what did you learn what is your message after this experience Iqbal said in Persian dar jahan natwan agar mardan azist hum chu mardan jaan supardan zindagi ist and this is what iqbal said his tribute to tipu sultan that if it is not possible to live like a man in this life then it is better <coughs> true life is giving away life like a man in this life dar jahan natwan agar mardan aziz hum chu mardan jaan supardan zindagi ist okay and and about gidar ki 100 saal sorry sher ki एक दिन की जिंदगी गीदर की सौ साल जिंदगी से बेहतर है जावेद नामा में इकबाल फरमाते हैं जिंदगी राचीस्त रस्मोदीन उखेश जिंदगी राचीस्त रस्मोदीन उखेश यकदम शेरी बसोल मेश दैट वट इज लाइफ एंड इट्स कन्वेंशन वट इज लाइफ एंड इट्स कन्वेंशन इट इज लाइक one moment of a lion is better than a hundred years of sheep this is what iqbal said in jawed nama paying a tribute to tipu sultan tipu sultan chose to fight hand to hand battle with the british soldiers and he was fighting he was injured and then how he died uh, was narrated by one of his servants again raja khan who was his private servant that sultan was injured he had been shot he was injured he was lying on the floor and a british soldier came and he put his hand on the belt because the sultan was wearing a very lavish belt with with the gems studded on the belt you know rubies and diamonds and all kinds of stuff so you sultan so the british soldier saw the glittering gems he went for them as the booty of war he put his hand on the belt the sultan being you know when you injured that's when you become really really vulnerable and fragile that's why you want refuge you want to tell people oh please don't attack me don't hurt me if you are a coward if you don't believe in your cause right that's the time you should be begging for your life right in this state when the sultan knows his life is in danger he goes for the soldier with a sword in his hand and he strikes him with the sword on his leg so he cuts the leg of the british soldier the british soldier steps back takes a name and shoots the sultan in the temple in the temple just above his ear and that was the bullet that took the life of the sultan and sultan was shaheed therefore rahmatullah alayh and his body was found later on by uh the duke of wellington who became the hero of the battle of waterloo in 1815 who defeated the man who defeated napoleon bonaparte in the battle of waterloo he was personally present at the time when sultan's body was found and the man who found the body himself wrote about it his name was major alexander beatson the very man who found the diary of tipu sultan the dreams diary right he is the one who found it and he gave it over to the government and then it ended up in the british library 
Alexander Beetson writes that when he when we found his body hours after his martyrdom hours hours have gone his body was still warm when they touched his temple they thought he was alive his eyes were open and there was an appearance of dignity and honor on his face he was small in stature his hands were very small right he was bold and he was wearing cloth of linen at the time and he were, he had uh, a robe you know what we call in the arabic language robe he had dignity a look of dignity on his face and then he was taken to the palace handed over to the family the next day there was a funeral uh, 21 gun salute was presented by the british as an honor to the sultan who died fighting he was buried in the mausoleum of his father hyder ali and the very same night such a heavy storm came that one of the british soldiers captain bailey who recorded it stated that never we have seen anything like it we have been through sea journeys we have seen storms but there was nothing like it there were camels seen flying in wind camels tents were completely ripped apart the british army was completely devastated after sultan had been buried the very night the storm came as if the heavens were angry with the british and the east india company for killing such a man there's a lot i can say about this i will stop here for now and quickly go through the presentation brothers and sisters if you have any questions please do put them forward and we can talk about this individual in more detail um, another time thank you so much for listening wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin so if you keep going through the presentation this is tipu sultan this is what he looked like right this is his actual appearance a lot of people claim that he had beard to make him all religious no he didn't have a beard because he had little hair on his body people who knew him personally you know you see some people nowadays they have very small beard hair right they don't have any beard on their you know any hair on the he had no hair on his body literally he had a mustache but had little uh, hair on his face he didn't have any facial hair so this is what he looked like uh, these are some of the images painted by painters respectively in his time and if we keep go- this is keep going forward this is about aurangzeb alamgir and other mogul emperors the decline of the moguls i were talking about uh if you keep going keep going keep going so this is the background history so this is what okay i'm going to stop this online uh business and thank you very much for listening everyone uh we will be talking uh, about the presentation offline assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi if you have any questions please post them in comments and i will try my best to respond to them i will quickly re- recommend some sources on tipu sultan uh, the books of kate brittlebank okay very good then uh we have mahmud al hasan the history of tipu sultan we have if you want to read a classical old um, History of Tipu Sultan is called Sultanate Khudadad by I forgot the name Allahu Akbar I forgot the name of the author the book is titled Sultanate Khudadad and there are many more books I can recommend if you want the names I can put them in comments until then assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh